I wanted to uh, kind of tell you about something that Douglas Copeland, who's, a, who's been a crucial part uh, and an important family member of the Global Art Forum that the last few years um, has told me again and again uh, over the number of years that we've known each other. Um, and that's, well, for a start, he was born in 1961. And he tells me um, that so much of his childhood, and therefore so much of his later creative adulthood, was formed under the shadow of the ato atomic mushroom cloud. And, of course, he wasn't the only one. Millions truly believed mutual annihilation was just a misunderstanding away. I remember it myself, and maybe you do too. Our eschatological anxieties have, of course, moved on. You can take your pick. But it's easy to forget that the latter half of the 20th century seemed to very nearly not have a future far enough to get to the 21st century. And now, when we hear the word cloud, we're being described our digitally liberated lives, moving from device to device, hotspot to hipster cafe, very much like the ones described in Michelle's postcard. We're, being, we're being described the simultaneity of immateriality and an inconceivably complex infrastructure which makes our supposedly digitally liberated lives. Joao Ribas is senior curator and deputy director of the Sheralve Museum of Contemporary Art in Porto. His recent publication in the Holocene is published by Sternberg Press. And so to tell us what happened between the first cloud and the second, and why both are emblems of technologically radical futures, will you please welcome Joao Ribas. Thank you. Hi, yeah. good afternoon. Uh, first off, I want to thank Schumann for this thrilling invitation and to all the organizers for making it possible for me to be here. And I hope that these modest reflections somehow do justice to that invitation. Um, since the second half of the 20th century, we've lived under the shadow of two clouds. First, the mushroom cloud of the atomic bomb and now the cloud of information networks. The metaphor of post-war paranoia become the utopian metaphor for our interconnected world. If the first cloud represented the possible annihilation of civilization, today's cloud represents a kind of information-saturated condition in which we live, work, and play. And these two clouds have shaped and embedded themselves practically into our everyday lives. Their effects felt both in the world and in our dreams, in physical matter, as well as our metabolism. And through these two clouds, a new sublime has come to replace the natural sublime of the 19th century. What I want to do is to attempt to briefly describe what I would call the phantasmagoric character of this sublime, to try to draw out the shape of its expanding edges and the shadow that these two clouds have come to cast over us, and to ask why we continuously produce new sublimes, first natural, then atomic, now informational, and why we always need to produce ways to distance ourselves from it, like the nuclear bunker or the algorithm. The traditional concept of the sublime represents the unrepresentable. It evokes something that is so vast or unbounded that we cannot contain it or understand it in totality. Yet it's always experienced from a distance. It might be terrifying or overwhelming, but we experience it from uh, a, a distance away from its ability to harm us. And the common 19th and 18th and 19th century examples include the sea, infinity, and clouds in the sky, somewhere between physical matter and abstract form. And it's in these ineffable clouds that lie the nature of our sublime. These two sublime clouds, in fact, have a direct historical connection. The emergence of the digital cloud uh, or the world that the digital cloud condenses emerges from the technologies of the earlier cloud. Most of the images of the mushroom cloud that we know come from the nuclear tests conducted during World War II, beginning with the Trinity test on July 16, 1945. And it's this test that introduces this image into the popular imagination. The scale 
of this cloud was both inconceivable in the potential destruction it could cause and unrepresentable. And so it was fixed only in this unbounded, alluring, and ever-changing shape of a cloud. This cloud captured, quote, the superheated sphere of burning gas that can blind a person with its beauty, its dripping solar golds and reds, the pulverized mass of radioactive debris with skirted stem and smoldering cap, as Don DeLillo describes in Underworld. The destruction it could cause was itself sublimely terrifying. As the pilot that led the Hiroshima mission wrote, there were scattered clouds over the city of Hiroshima. The weather seemed ideal to me. The city would be obscured and thus saved. But the clouds over Hiroshima diminished and scattered. The bomb missed its target and destroyed the city. The paranoia condensed in the image of the mushroom cloud stems from the event that haunted over the post-war period, the possible destruction of the evidential presence of all human life on planet Earth. In fact, the stockpile of nuclear weapons in uh, the post-war period could assure the death of every single person on the planet many, many, many times over. And so the image of the cloud effectively involved coming to terms with the potential non-existence of, of the human, but really through an image of its end frozen in the single fraction of a second, with its radiation as hot as the sun. The political response to this potential destruction was called mutually assured destruction. The variety of war game scenarios played out by defense strategists rested precisely on making sure that either side had nothing to gain by initiating a nuclear attack. This entailed retaining the ability to retaliate after an attack, impossible if communication structures were disrupted by that initial attack. Uh, by the way, radio waves wouldn't work because the, the resulting radiation would block out the radio frequencies. Telephone wouldn't work because you could blow out the telephone uh, network. So how could the nuclear button be pushed in response and assure the total annihilation of the attacking enemy, which would deter the enemy from attacking you in the first place? Well, Paul Barron, a researcher at the RAND Corporation, proposed an answer in 1962. Rather than using a, a centralized network, which would obviously be vulnerable since you could destroy a center point and therefore disrupt the entire network, he proposed the creation of distributed networks. A series of nodes would route information divided into message blocks, node to node, ensuring it could operate after a destruction. The Pentagon's ARPANET was an attempt at this kind of distributed network. On October 29, 1969, the first data traveled between two nodes of the then four node network eventually evolving to become what we now call the internet. In fact, this original system used email, packet switching, and TCP IP protocols, which define um, our daily communication system. So there's a, a direct connection between these two clouds. Of course, these advanced technologies have now evolved to fit the palm of our hand. We live in the aftermath of these four nodes proliferation into a vast global network, walking around with an immense archive of images in our pockets and a digital shadow of ourselves floating above us as a cloud. We are assailed with its effects and affects, its solicitation of emotion and consumption daily. And this new cloud is a representation of the vast realm of big data on also on an unprecedented scale. One billion cell phones producing 18 hexabytes of data each month, more than a seventh of the world's population on Facebook, a third of global internet users accessing the Amazon cloud daily, and five billion smartphones on Earth by 2020. So a cloud is once again our way of dealing with the vastness of it all, where data can resolve complex problems and even manifest unconscious desire. If you like the Global Art Forum, you may also like X. We now think, see, and feel through a cloud. A cloud which is starting to encompass physical as well as biological material, all producing a steady pulse of data. The use of the term cloud computing itself to refer to the hosting of processing power, memory, software, and applications on remote data servers gained wide prominence around the mid-2000s. When corporations began using the term to describe information architecture for accessing data over the web. Google CEO Eric Schmidt explained in 2006 we call it cloud computing. They should be in a cloud somewhere. 
But the meteorological metaphor used was, in fact, not new. There are clouds throughout the history of computing, as there are clouds, in fact, throughout the history of art. Lewis Fry Richardson, for example, had attempted to predict the weather by modeling the Earth's atmosphere using mathematical equations during World War I. He estimated that 64,000 people would be needed to complete them. Of course, these calculations were ideally suited for the first modern computer, the ENIAC, which provided a single-day prediction of the weather in 1950. There are clouds, too, in the first Photoshop image created by John Knoll in 1987. Knoll's image marks a decisive moment in the relationship between the virtual and the real. And it also recalls, perhaps not unconsciously, an earlier sublime with a particular resemblance to the sublime as depicted in Caspar David Friedrich's Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog from 1880. The threat of the nuclear cloud involved as well the invisible danger of ionizing radiation and radioactive fallout. Quote, an invisible dust of radioactive death sand could spread over cities of the earth and kill their populations without the noisy warning of an atomic bomb, declared one scientific authority. This invisible terror extended the effect of the bomb in the form of invisible gamma rays, which could either kill instantaneously or cause cells to mutate cancerously. This menacing radiation found representation in the monstrous sublime scale of Godzilla, a monster unleashed by a nuclear explosion, as well as a variety of cultural phenomena from Spider-Man to zombies. Radiation represented a new kind of technological threat. Its danger was unseen, unfelt, tasteless, and odorless, yet potentially everywhere. Information floating in the cloud replaces this threat of radiation. Though it forms the basis of much of our contemporary life, it is not present to us. It is neither felt nor seen directly. Data moves through apparently unseen and pervasive ways. What we feel is the shadow of this cloud pressing upon us and the world around us. The resulting consumptive effects are many. Financial crashes, computer glitches, viruses, loneliness, exhaustion, cognitive fatigue, attention disorder, and carpal tunnel syndrome. While the digital is essentially beyond exhaustion, as Rem Kulhas claims, the human body is not. Hence the variety of new technologies to enhance or ameliorate the effects of the cloud. Caffeine in power drinks, ADHD medication, antidepressants, extended working hours and endless emails, ergonomic chairs, and dating apps. These are some of the resulting after effects of living under a cloud. Slow events rather than cataclysmic ones. And algorithms and pattern finding software mediate the vastness of this sublime. But they also introduce novel cognitive and sensorial orders as a result. One of the most profound was announced by Gmail's original tagline in 2004, search, don't sort. The simple phrase, in fact, evinces a major structural change. Sorting was the principal means and methodology for the production of knowledge for centuries in the form of taxonomies, sciences, libraries, and encyclopedias. Search implies that everything can exist side by side all at once and a flattened ontology of both instant access and simultaneity. All you need is a mediating algorithm. The cloud, as this immense storehouse of knowledge, both fulfills the dream of the French encyclopedist and negates the very grounds on which it was founded. The cloud covers us in its sensorial haze, its sights, sounds, and patterns, yet the nebulous, edgeless metaphor, in fact, masks and liter literally naturalizes power. While the cloud, in keeping with its image, appears mutable, ever-present, and formless, a diaphanous no place. It in fact involves vast amounts of energy and raw material. 30 billion watts of electricity, for example, the equivalent of 30 nuclear power plants. Six to 12% is used for actual calculations, the rest for generators running on diesel or to power cooling systems. The combined spending on the cloud, both public and private, is said to be nearly 22.6 billion worldwide, a very large price for a clever nowhere that is actually comprised of energy consuming physical parts. This consumption has an ecological scale as well, draining power and geomorphic scale. Toxic lakes that are the dumping ground for waste created by the production of cerium, the rare metal used in touchscreens and smartphones, and high-speed fiber optic cables blasted through mountains 
to increase traffic by mere microseconds. The sublime speeds that regulate financial instruments but are imperceptible to human senses. Money dissipates into the cloud as credit. A financial system of unbacked fiat currency is no longer, quote, anchored in fixed real assets, but functions as a fiction play of signs detached from the real economy, as Josef Vogel explains. These financial abstractions function as an abstraction of an abstraction, a kind of technological conclusion to Turner's clouds. And credit serves not just as a type of monetary transaction, but as the essence of all transactions in the cloud. Its economic units are energy and credit. It's a haze without referent or bottom, without apparent fixed form or fixed point. All that is solid melts into air. And we interact with this no place through the interfaces and decentralized networks that we hold in our hands every day. We can, as Kant writes of the sublime, regard an object as fearful without being afraid of it. And our estimation of ourselves in relation to this object loses nothing to the fact that we regard ourselves as safe in order to feel this inspiring satisfaction. Our screens allow us to stand back and represent the sublime without terror. For example, the sublime image of contemporary terror, the decapitated headless body, has its digital equivalent in the heads tagged on Facebook, and the headless fat person identified by Charlotte Cooper, stock images of dehumanized bodies photographed without consent and reproduced alongside text about eating or obesity. Similarly, crimes involving a bystander or attacker standing back to record a video or still image of that crime using a mobile phone are becoming increasingly common. There is a growing digital archive of witnessed crime in the cloud. The cloud itself has begun to demonstrate its own form of witnessing. The automation of surveillance, for example, has resulted in what Harun Faroqi calls operational images, machines that see for other machines. These include facial recognition software that can identify someone automatically from a digital image. It begs the question, where should we stand in relationship to this sublime? This violence is enacted not just on people, but on images themselves. We no longer merely look at images. We pinch, drag, scroll, swipe, and flick them. We caress, we fondle them, we cut and reshape them with the ease of a moving finger. And we compress them in order to share them. When an image is compressed, a portion of its contents is in fact destroyed. One visible artifact of this iconoclastic gesture is the pixel, which mimetically enacts the abstraction. It even hints at how the cloud might see us. So much so that images become witnesses, agents, and actors, blurring the line between bits and atoms, image and object, data and material. New advances in digital forensics, for example, allow for the creation of portraits from DNA samples taken from crime scenes. Known as DNA phenotyping, this can determine physical characteristics, such as, such as eye, skin, and hair color, from the DNA in a single, in a single strand of hair. And this vast sublime, like the previous one, has the potential to shape or mutate DNA. The vastness of the sublime includes the persistent problem of storage and retrieval. As our archive in the cloud grows exponentially, data begets more data, and every image becomes the source for the production of ever more images. The European Bioinformatic Institute has recently developed a high-capacity, low-maintenance information storage system using synthesized DNA. As a means to store vast amounts of data for thousands of years, this would make it possi possible for 100 million hours of high-def video to be stored in a small amount of human genetic material. In effect, the storage density of DNA, a thousand times the capacity of today's digital media, could soon unite the memory of the human species that is our genome with the vast sublime we've now dreamed up in the clouds. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Hi. Thanks so much, Ra. Um, we're just going to spend uh, about maybe about 10 minutes back and forth on, on, on some of 
that. Um, one of the first things you mention, which perhaps I certainly found um, surprising and unexpected on this topic, was the, the use of the word sublime. Uh, and I guess it's one of the many ways in which you um, are, able, are able to navigate or toggle between these two uh, form cloud formations, as it were, uh, but also uh, historical eras. On that topic of the sublime, um, I, one of the, one of the uh, simple ways in which the sublime, in the romanticist sense of the word, would be described uh, would be that of a terrifying beauty, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and, you know, you have the image of Caspar David Friedrich with the Rucken figure, uh, kind of beholding uh, the, in, the uh, enormity, the vastness, the infinity, etc., of nature, and I guess ultimately, if, if you so wish, God or a, a kind of divinity. Um, what's very interesting uh, with the with the very with the first um, uh, the the first test of the atomic bomb uh, and the 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 shape that the the mushroom cloud took was very very quickly there was a, a, a visual beauty that was apprehended in this of, I mean uh, firstly by those who were its authors in a way like oh my god isn't I mean on the one hand, isn't that awesome? If, yeah. and, um, and then later, and, and I guess we then see it in uh, a lot of artwork, particularly in the 60s, of course, when, when the kind of anxiety of, uh, uh, really, really seeps into, uh, in, into culture. And I was wondering, I mean, the, the visual, that terrifying beauty of that cloud uh, in, in the history of romanticism is quite obvious, perhaps, and I'm, I'm wondering wh what might the terrifying beauty of our digital cloud be, given that it's, it, it's not visible, and that's part of its, its sublimity, as it were. So, right, so there would be a, there would be a difference between the, the, the clear representation of an event and this abstracted image. Um, that's a good question. I, I, in a way, I would I would try I would slightly evade your question and, and mm. <laughs> sidestep and slip out of it by saying it's not it's a post-representational condition. Mm. So in a sense, that's part of the point is you can't take a picture of of this thing that's pulsing, uh, and so you the sh the shadow I guess it, is is what I would what I would use. So all the attempts to represent it are slightly ridiculous. Yeah. Um, because the scale doesn't work. In one essence, in one representation, you see that the cloud is overwhelming the person, and the other one, they're containing it in their hand. And so the scale is so vast that you cannot find an image to represent it. The, you brought up something earlier uh, in our conversation yesterday, which I think is relevant to this point, which is that the cloud as an image itself is a huge representational problem. Um, so it, this is another version. So what do I mean by that? Um, even getting a photograph of a cloud was, was, was particularly tricky. Um, and in early photography, it was virtually impossible because the cloud moved too fast. Um, so the exposure time versus the cloud movement time made it so that you have very few pictures of clouds in the early history of photography. It's also an issue, as you brought up, in, in, uh, in the history of art in relationship to Renaissance perspective because the cloud is an object that cannot be depicted according to the rules of perspective. Um, even though it's one of the first abstract images ever to be depicted. So at simul it, there is a concurrent history of a representational problem of how do you represent this shape visually, and also clearly a relationship between clouds and a kind of abstraction. These two running parallels, I think, there's, con there's a consistent representational problem. And in fact, the, the, the image of the mushroom clouds are very misleading, because what you're seeing is, is something is an impossible image to a certain extent. It implies a certain distance, it implies a certain exposure, and in fact, there's, it doesn't have a shape. Its shape is constantly mm. moving. It's just fixed into this one particularly, um, maybe aesthetically pleasing shape for us. Um, and I like, I sort of like how somehow subconsciously there is a, an evocation of the mushroom cap in this cloud beaming Wi-Fi. 
I think there is a kind of imaginary that's reproducing that. Um, if that goes, if yeah. that goes toward answering your question. But I would say you have, we have to look at after effects. Reverse the logic of manipulating uh, digital space to make it look like real space and start looking at the after effects of digital space in real space. And so like the, the, the headless corpse, uh, the headless fat person is kind of a representation of the cloud. The head is somehow floating in the cloud, um, if, that, if that makes any sense. <laughs> um, just to ask you a little bit about time. One of the, uh, one of the things that could be said about the, the world and the reality that the cloud, which is in a, in a, in a way um, uh, and basically taking our digital material and, and storing it yeah. not there, physically close right. to you anymore, but right. there, is uh, one could argue that it, uh, it, you know, begins, it has had uh, a profound uh, and is having a profound effect on our memory. Yeah. or our necessity to remember things. Why remember anything if you can just upload it and then download it? And so I wonder, um, and, and, and I guess in that, the book that I, I did with, with Hans Ulrich and Doug Copeland, The Extreme Present, the extreme present was this, is, is what's left when the future is what we inhabit now and the past, you don't need it anymore because you upload it to the cloud. <laughs> Right, so all yeah. you're left with is this in, interstice, yeah. this just the, the ever-present now. And I wonder whether in all your research and so on and so forth, particularly on the digital cloud, the, um, the relationship between the digital cloud and time sure. um, is something that you came, yeah. came up with. Sure, just a, a quick note on the memory thing. Um, I actually think of it more in relationship to, to ancient Greek rhetoric, which has nothing to do with the digital cloud in a way, but, but the, 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 in a way, there's, there's always been a relationship between architecture and memory. And so Quintilian, who's a Greek order, or Cicero, used two devices, which, which is if you need to remember something, take a building, walk through the building, and leave little pieces of what you want to remember in features of that building. So when you go back in your mind and you look at the column, you remember to say thank you to Schumann for the invitation. Um, that is, in, in, a, in essence, only different, it's only different in degree of code. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that this, this is an old, an old issue. The question of time is really interesting because in fact there's a, there's a spatial temporal dimension to the cloud which is fascinating. So being closer, like cable, algorithms want to be as close as possible to the two points uh, in which they're trading. And so you can monetize that distance. So in fact, if you're, you take a room this size and you put the main server or the cables that come up from the ground that go into the, into the server, you can pay, there's, there's T degrees of how close you are because that's how fast you are. And that physical distance... Latency, right? I think it's yeah, latency. and that physical distance is, again, imperceptible, but it's monetized. So time is actually incredibly important mm -hmm. and the reshaping of space in order to conquer microseconds of time. You're talking about a slightly different time. I, I'm not so nostalgic for the memorious, um, although I have to say that I think that feats of memory will become increasingly, uh, I think, will become increasingly um, transcendent. Like I think like, the, it's to, and this is something that I'm particularly interested in, like the recitation of the Quran from memory, is that it becomes really transcendent, as does the kind of the role of the actor, mm. who in a sense embodies a, a, a recitation of, of material. So we may have, in fact, sort of wandering storytellers uh, downloading from the cloud. I, I think it's a false problem. I think the speed problem is somewhere else, mm -hmm. if, that, if that works. Um, how many of your friends' phone numbers can you still remember? I could never remember any of my friends' phone numbers. I've been largely unaffected by the cloud. Uh, I can yeah. remember my mom's phone number. Yeah. I can remember my home phone number from when I was a child. But, but I don't particularly find, I'm destroying this stage, I don't particularly find that kind of memory important or, or interesting to me. But there are other parts of memory that I do find fascinating. And I think what the cloud might help us to do is to remember, there's an old Nietzsche thing about, um, the dignity of forgetting. The that's problem, that again? the dignity of forgetting. Dignity. I think that's the problem. The cloud does not allow it, does not give us the dignity mm. of forgetting. 
It's not really remembering. It's that we, we, don't, we don't have the capacity to forget. It's in the untimely meditations. Every, every people, all the peoples in the world need to figure out what to forget. And, and I guess part of that is the, that, that moment where you hear someone has passed away, but their social media it still keeps, yeah. is still pulsing. The digital shadow is still, is, still, is still operating. And so that's both an ontological and a legal question. In fact, there are lots of ethical questions here. Do we own our own image? What, do we, what is the relationship between the self and its data shadow? Is it autonomous in some way? Uh, or is it in fact, are we tethered to it in some, in some particular fashion? So there's a kind of splitting of, of presence, um, which, which is interesting. And, and in a sense, you could break it down into a storage problem. Um, and you could just choose your platforms. Mm. The human brain is actually incredibly effective. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an effective storage device. But if you replace the human brain with human DNA, it could be interesting, because you could carry around you know, the entire works of, I don't know, Douglas Copeland in your, in your DNA and potentially pass it on to your progeny. Uh, and you just need a retrieval system. Um, but I can't remember my, my friend's phone numbers, but I can recite like passages of Shakespeare. There's some glitch, and neither is particularly useful. <laughs> Depends who you're talking to. Um, you, you quoted uh, Don DeLillo. Um, yeah. I also, of course, thought of Thomas Pynchon. Um, and I'm a simple kind of question about, you know, your story um, basically um, finds the the pinch point between cloud, the first cloud and the second, that the first, the, the, uh, basic, the first cloud gives rise to an, infra an infrastructural necessity that then, in a sense, gives rise to the, the cloud that we're now all in and not in. And I wondered whether that, that um, that's like classic bit of, you know, paranoid critical method history making. Sure. And I wonder whether that's something you knew before you started the project or it's something you discovered doing the that research. I was, that I was paranoid before? That you were paranoid before. No, it's a very simple and dumb thing. Obviously, there's, there's a whole cultural history. We're going to stop in 20 seconds. I'm going to stop in 20 no, we're seconds. Okay. We're okay. There's a whole cultural history um, related to this, which is fascinating. Uh, and DeLillo is, is, is part of it. Pynchon, of course. There's a whole culture of a nuclear war, including things you don't really think about, like the Hulk. Um, and, and lots of other things. And, um, and I grew up in that shadow, or at least it was very present to me. But the, um, it, was, it, it arose from a very simple point, which is I had two windows open. Mm. Uh, I had done a lot of work on the relationship of, of, of technology, particularly art and science, in the 50s and 60s in relationship to the post-war nuclear threat. But I had these two images, in a sense, open on two multiple windows. And I just kind of did this double take. And then I spent several months anxiously trying to figure out why this wasn't a novel idea. Because certainly somebody had made that connection before. And, um, and I really couldn't find it. So I thought, all right, that works. Um, but it was very simple. It governed by that, that simultaneous logic, right? And I would, I would even, I would, I would in defiance to, this, to the memorials say, something about simultaneity is in, and this flat axis is, is hugely uh, awe-inspiring because we can actually digitize the past to such an extent uh, as much as we are now registering the present. Um, so, so I think that simultaneity of access, the problem is what, to me it seems more and more the problem is what mediates in between and who controls the mediation. And the fact that algorithmically speaking, that mediation is, transparent, is, is both transparent and opaque. We know how it works, but we don't know how it's working. Um, we don't know who, in, in, from the dumbest political sense of who owns to the most abstract uh, sense in which when the algorithms start firing off on their own on their own speed you get books that go for a million dollars on Amazon or, or or derivatives trading between each other to the point where financial systems collapse and my last question simply talking about your own future uh, I, this um, one shape in which this research took was an exhibition at, at, at Cheryl um, and there's a publication but is this something you're, you're hoping to 
to to continue in some way or another? Yeah, I think I think insofar as it relates to the the what, this triangle between science, technology, and or art, science, and technology, which is some. I worked at MIT for four years, and so I was very very immersed in that history. And I think it's a very rich history. And there's something about the role of artists or the aesthetic in, in negotiating social questions in relationship to technology that seems to always have a great effect um, historically. And I think that that, I've come to understand more about our contemporary condition through, through the art that's being made now than I would say through any other means. And so that interests me insofar as it's historically been proven that an artist, la the lateral thinking of, an, of, of artistic practice can be hugely, hugely productive in dealing with these questions, particularly if, if they're in the realm of visuality. Mm. For example, all these shards, which are effectively the shards of all the objects that are broken up in digital space, are being reconstituted by everyone else. By, or I'm sorry, they're being reconstituted by artists in a digital space, even as they're broken apart by everyone else daily. Hitor Stahl has this great uh, thing that she refers to, which is that iconoclasm of YouTube, where we take something, we break it into pieces, and how that's, that's not that different from a 16th century iconoclast, shattering the face of a, of a, of a, of a, of a religious icon. Fantastic. We've run out of time. Will you please join me in thanking Jarre Rivas? Thank, Thank you, you so much. much.